Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and today I'm going to show you how to build a bargain basement budget gaming PC with all this. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so today we're going to attempt to do a video filmed build. Now, I'll give you a quick run through of the parts that we're going to be using. So starting off in the far corner, we've got the Cooler Master Q300L, which is um, a new micro ATX case as of the end of sort of 2017, 2018. They've really only just come into stock now, and it's kind of March 2018 now. So I decided I want to do a build with that. So in order to do a good build in there, or something which is justifiable in that kind of case, a budget end case, I'm going to do a budget gaming build. So to go with that, we've got the uh, ASRock, AB350M, which is a, a Ryzen AM4 based board and is suitable for the new Ryzen APUs, the Bristol Ridge. So, obviously, hence the Ryzen 3 2200G, which is going to be sitting in there and powering both the system for compute tasks and also for graphics. Uh, there is going to be an option to add a graphics card with the PCI Express slot, which is in there. But at the moment, graphics card prices are absolutely mental, so we're not going to even contemplate buying a graphics card at the moment until prices come down to a, a more sensible level. Um, to go with uh, with this, well, also we've got a Be Quiet System Power 8 400 watt power supply, so we'll be putting that in there. That's going to be more than adequate to power the system with the APU, and we'll probably just about squeeze enough power out of it to run a, a mid level graphics card up to, I would say, around about an RX 480 maybe a GTX uh, 970, that kind of level, a 1050 Ti would be no problem at all. So lots of flexibility in this platform and lots of potential upgrade paths. Speaking of which, also you could upgrade the CPU or APU to uh, the latest Ryzen sort of 1800X or 1700X or the new 2000 series, which are gonna be released later on in this year. So lots of uh, scalability from this little build. So to go with, the case, the motherboard, power supply, motherboard, all this stuff. We've got uh, some QMOX DDR RAM. Now at the moment, RAM prices are again, are ridiculous, but you can't really build a PC without RAM. So that's one thing you have to have. At the moment, that was the cheapest eight gig DDR4 RAM sticks I could find. The rated speeds are 2400, which I know isn't great and isn't the best thing to have with uh, APU because they do prefer the faster RAM speeds. But in this case, we're more than likely going to be putting a separate GPU in the system at some point. So RAM speeds aren't going to be that important. If I'd gone for some sort of 3200 or even higher rated RAM, the price would have doubled. At the moment, those eight gig sticks were 70 pounds. If I wanted to go for the faster speeds, you're looking at 100, 120 just for eight gigs, which in my mind is mental. Eight gigs should be like 30 pounds or $40. Prices are absolutely mental. Anyway, that's my rant over with. So moving on to the fans that you can see here. There's five fans there. There's room for five fans in there, but I'm only gonna use four. And the reason being is these Asia Horse fans I bought, I bought about eight of the white ones and eight of the red ones. Do I say white? Basically, I've got loads of red ones and loads of white ones. Now this is gonna be a black and red theme build, as you can probably tell from what's going on here but one of these fans is white. So when we go through the testing process, we're gonna fire these fans up and see which one's the white one and get that out of the build. Although, you never know, I might even leave it in there just to make it a bit of interest. We'll see. Anyway, so that's the parts introduced. Let's um, get on and build the system. Okay, so we cleared the table away and let's get started. So first thing to do, let's put the CPU in. So this is the uh, AMD Ryzen 2200G, which is a accelerated processing unit or advanced processing unit, or whatever you want to call it. Basically, it's a graphics card and a CPU all rolled into one nice little package. Now, in the box, you get a AMD Wraith cooler, which is very nice. Now, we're gonna use this for the initial build, but I've also got a Cooler Master uh, 212 LED, which I'm gonna replace. I wanna see how it compares with this. Uh, in regards to keeping it cool and also in terms of being able to overclock CPU stroke GPU stroke APU. So we're going to stick with that for now just so you can show you how you'd build it if you were buying these same products for yourself. Anything else in there? No. 
this is the important bit, this is what we want, the sticker, very important. Now AMD CPUs, or APUs, sorry, if I say CPU I mean the same thing, you know what I mean. AMD CPUs have got pins on the back of them, unlike the Intel equivalents, so be very careful when you're taking these out of the box. Um, if the pins bend, they can be bent back, which uh, I'll link to in another video. But if, you, uh, if you're very careful, they shouldn't bend at all. But obviously, if they, if they bend, you can bend them back. But they are brass or copper or whatever, so they have a tendency to snap. They're very small, so be very careful. Uh, so the first thing to do is to open up the uh, retention lever on the motherboard and lift it up fully. Then if you look on the board, in the corner, there is a little tag. I'll just spin around so there's a little tag just there which tells you which way the uh, CPU or processor whatever you want to call it which way it goes in and you see on the CPU itself there is a tag in the bottom corner now if you're wondering why I'm showing it to there it's because I've got another camera here so you can see the close-ups that's for the void shots that's for the close shots so being very careful lower the CPU into the socket now it should just plop straight into the socket. If it doesn't, stop right there, take it out, make sure you've got it in around the right way, have another go. It should drop straight in. It's, you shouldn't have to wiggle it or twist it to get it in. So, be careful. So, with a little bit of pressure or just your finger on the top, just hold it in place and press the lever down and lock it into position. So that is the CPU into our motherboard. More stuff we can get rid of. Okay, so next thing to do is to install the AMD cooler. Now, the motherboard comes as standard with the AM4 stroke AM3 retention brackets, um, but this particular cooler uses screw fixings. So what we need to do is get a crosshead screwdriver and remove the two retention brackets to gain access to the screws. So talking of which, important things for this job, you're going to need a crossheaded screwdriver, preferably with a magnetic tip, it will make your life easier in the long run. A 5mm box spanner or socket spanner, whatever you want to call that, to do up the nuts on the uh, motherboard mountings in your case, very handy. And also a pair of side cutters is always useful, so for cable ties or for trimming cables, that kind of thing. Oh, and another thing you could do is a little bit of Velcro banding just to tidy up cables, but optional extra up to you. Anyway, let's get on and take these screws out. drop it. Now it's always a good idea whenever you remove anything um, or any packaging or anything that comes with a motherboard or a processor or anything, try and keep all your bits. Best thing to do, keep them in the original boxes so should you have any issues with it for RMA or uh, you're reselling it on or something like that, you've always got all the bits to hand. So that's the uh, retention bracket or plate, whatever you want to call it which lives behind the motherboard. Now, if you're trying to put the CPU cooler on um, and you haven't got this on a flat surface, this thing is gonna go all over the place and will be very difficult to install. So, I would suggest if you're gonna do this, put it onto a solid surface, preferably something anti-static. Okay, so we've got our mounting lugs there, which you can see, and they should match up with the screws. And also, obviously, you've got your four pin uh, CPU power connector, uh, sorry, CPU cooler power connector, which is gonna end up up in this top location, so try and mount the uh, the cooler so that you've got a nice way of routing the cable. So I'm going to stick it around that way. And this uh, cooler, for, for example, has got actually pre-applied heat paste on there, so you can use the heat paste that it comes with, um, or obviously you can remove it and put some of your own, of your own favourite compound. So. With the uh, CPU cooler on top of the, the mount, do the screws up, but only do them a couple of screws each one, otherwise you'll find it really difficult. And try and do it in a, uh, a crisscross pattern. They may require a little bit of force to get these in because they are sprung. Maybe a lot of pressure. Okay, so that's all four screws done up. So now what we need to do is plug in the four pin power connector to the CPU fan header. 
So the next thing to do, uh, we've got a ram stick, so we might as well go ahead and stick those on. So with, with this board, you've got a release clip on only on one end. These are fixed on this end, which seems to be quite a common th thing these days. Uh, we're going to go with 16 gigs of RAM, because I already had an existing QMOX stick. Uh, I bought another one to match it up. And for some bizarre reason, one of them's got a black PCB, the other one's got a green. But when that's in there, you're never going to see it. So. Now QMOX, you may not have heard of them, but um, I guess they're not a particularly popular brand. But they do come with a lifetime warranty for the RAM stick, so what's not to like? Now with DDR4, there's a slight notch in the middle of the memory stick and that matches that with a notch on the main board so all you do is line it up and then seat it in with a firm press. Give it a little wiggle make sure it's in firmly. So seat the RAM stick into the end slot first then click into place and give it a wiggle just to make sure it's in firmly. So I think from uh, from pretty much most angles, that RAM doesn't look bad. Quite happy with that. Okay, so that's everything we need to do on the uh, motherboard. So let's get the motherboard out of the way now and we'll get the case up on the desk table and prepare that for the system. Okay, so I said I was gonna do the power supply next, uh, sorry, the case next, I lied, I'm gonna check to make sure that everything actually works before we go too far into this build. So what we do is test the motherboard uh, and the RAM, just make sure it boots, get a post screen before we go too far. So we need to get the power supply out and plug this into a power source, which I should have. And I'm gonna just crudely set up the system just so we can get it to post. Now with power supplies, there is a notch on the power supply connector, which needs to go on the notch of the motherboard. It's not the easiest of things to do in the best of times. And in case you're wondering what that noise was in the background, that was our robotic vacuum just starting up, which is probably the worst possible time it could have started up. If you want to see the video of how that goes, uh, you can't because I haven't done it yet. So, 8 pin connector for the uh, supplemental CPU and APU power plugs in in the top and should fit in with a reassuring click. So that is pretty much all we need to do to connect up power-wise. So if we plug our HDMI cable in, which I can barely see. Hmm. Oh my God, I can't believe I've done that. Oh my God. Okay, so we had a bit of a, uh, a meltdown there because me, in my wisdom, trying to search out the cheapest bargain I possibly could, got such a bargain on the motherboard, I forgot to see if it actually had HDMI or VGA outputs for the APU that I've purchased. Now the plan all along, kind of, was to add a older used graphics card to this PC gaming build, just to see what we can get for our money on a second-hand level with new components but a second-hand graphics card. So finding out that I didn't have an HDMI port has kind of forced my hand a little bit so I've had to quickly go upstairs and rescue this uh, trusty old GTX 770 which for reference I was actually going to use in this build at some point anyway but this has just uh, kind of forced my hand so schoolboy error bought the wrong part but it's been resolved and possibly the outcome is going to be better because obviously the GTX 770 is going to be far superior for gaming than the onboard graphics from the Vega in the uh, APU. So also, because we're not going to be using the onboard graphics, in theory, the TDP should be lower because we're not using that part of the chip. So we might be able to squeeze a bit more performance out of the CPU part of the APU. So we might overclock further and get better results still. Hope that makes sense. Possibly doesn't. A little bit flustered. Anyway, so we've connected all this up, so I'm going to uh, jump start it now and hopefully it should fire up. So to jump start one of these, you just, oh, power, power is always a good idea. And the power supply didn't blow up, so that's a good sign as well. There we go, it springs into life. Now if we 
change the source on the TV to HDMI. We might get something. Then again, we might not. <sighs> okay, well, we're back. So we've learned a few more things, a few more errors and a few more mistakes. So first big error is this motherboard I bought. It's a B350 chipset. The one thing it doesn't have, which I needed to do some of my testing for the APU is a HDMI slot, which this doesn't have, which I kind of overlooked, but all is not lost because I did intend to eventually use the MSI GTX 770. Again, because it's, uh, I had it lying around, it's red and black and it fits in with the build. So happy days. Um, just brought things forward a little bit more. So now I can turn off the APU, uh, sorry, the graphics part of the processor. And hopefully now with the TDP, less things being used, I can push it up higher and get a better overclock on the CPU part. So that's all good. Now, another mistake I learned just now, which I've cut from this video, is the fact that this board, despite saying it supported uh, Bristol Ridge and Raven Ridge, it didn't. The BIOS version of this board was 3.1. The earliest BIOS, BIOS version that supports it was about 4.4, 4. 4 point something. So I've had to do an upgrade of the BIOS via USB from 3.1 up to 3.2, which is a bridge BIOS, and then from 3.2 up to the latest, which is 4.5. Um, I'll possibly put links in the description for that, so if you're gonna go through the same thing as me, you've got the links there so you can do it. Luckily, I had a uh, Ryzen 1700X, which is in my other machine, which I had to quickly disassemble to get the CPU out of that, to put it into here so I could boot it up, so I could plug the USB in to update the BIOS, then take the CPU out to get that back up and running so that would record and put the old, put the new CPU back in here. Okay, so you with me so far? Okay, so two lessons learned. Third lesson learned. This cooler, I don't know whether it's supposed to sound like it, but it sounds terrible and it just won't do. And because we're gonna be doing some hopefully serious overclocking with this. I've decided to go one step further in the process again, and I'm gonna install the Cooler Master Hyper 212 LED. So hopefully with that, it's a better cooler than this, obviously. And it's red and black again, so that fits in the build. And we should be able to get some proper decent overclocks using that cooler. So that's the next part. Let's get that installed next. So this is the uh, Hyper 212, part of the legendary Hyper 212 series. This is the LED version, slightly aerated and also supports the uh, AM4 boards with this new, albeit probably about 15 year old design clamp, which uh, goes over the existing brackets, which are on most AM3 Plus boards and AM4 boards. So as you probably noticed, the eagle eyed amongst you, I've already put the, uh, the plastic retaining clips or lugs back on the motherboard uh, obviously, we took them out, off, took them off previously for the uh, stock AMD cooler, but we're not going to use that now. So let's go over to the 212 LED. Now I've already applied CPU paste to the actual uh, CPU. I'm going to call it a CPU now because it's not an APU anymore because we're not using the graphics. And this is going to be pretty straightforward. All you do is put the clip through the underside and then twist to get it lined up, which is sometimes easier said than done. Actually, I think it goes around the other way. The clip at the back, so it's going that way. And I don't know if you can pick that up on the other camera. So the lug goes just in the middle of there. There's a slightly raised section where there's two of the fins which are higher than the others. And that's where the kind of center point is. So that can be locked in. All right, let's get the CPU cooler onto the board. So line it up so it's pretty much in the right place. Get the lug over the front. And then the clip over the back. 
sometimes requires a little bit of a force. Okay, so we've uh, lowered the camera down so you can get a better picture of what's going on here. So there is the clamp and that is in the kind of unlocked state, but even so it's, it's really, really tight. So all it requires is a flip over and that's the cooler locked in position. And that sucker is not going anywhere. So that's the cooler and the RAM attached to the board. So now we can fire it up and make sure it works. So next is the graphics card. So just plonk that in. And lock it into position. Let's move that camera so you can see what's going on. Connect up the PCI Express connectors. He says in a Bristolian way. Connectors! Make sure you get the PCI connectors connected, otherwise when you try and boot up it won't, because it won't have any power. These are really, really little tricky things, especially if you've got sausage fingers like me. Okay, so, oh, didn't connect the CPU fan, so we better do that. Schoolboy error. Right, so turn that on, and we need something to jumpstart the PC. Screwdriver's always a good one. If you short out the two pins for the power switch, the PC should come on. So let's give it some power. Oh. Let's plug in HDMI, so you won't get an output regardless. Okay, fingers crossed, second or third time lucky. Now that is a lot, lot quieter than it was last time we tried this. You never know, it might even boot up. Okay. Oh, yes, result. So the BIOS was just going through to uh, disable the APU so that the GPU could take over. I hate it when it does that, nerve wracking. Okay, so I don't know if you can pick that up. Let's flip the screen up. Oh, wrong way. Okay, sorry about the camera angles, guys, but it is what it is. So, uh, motherboard there, so we can see now uh, BIOS version's 4.5, which is what we needed, otherwise it wouldn't recognize the damn processor. Uh, processor AMD Ryzen 3 2200G with Radeon Vega graphics. Processor speed 3500, the processor speed base clock is 3500 with a turbo frequency of 3.7, but hopefully we'll be able to ignore that completely and we're going to take it up to 4 gig and beyond, maybe. Um, cache wise, you've got 32K 8-way level 1, level 2 you've got 512 8-way, and level 3 you've got 4 megabytes of 16-way cache. Uh, memory, as you can see, is 16 uh, gigabytes, and it's in dual channel mode. It'd be hard not to, because there's only two slots, so there you go. Uh, currently, the RAM is registering as uh, DDR2133, but we'll play around with that later on in the BIOS once we get it all set up. But uh, at the moment, everything's booted up, and actually looks quite nice with all these red LEDs and all the red and black ma mixing together. So let's turn it off now, disconnect everything we don't need to be connected at the moment and um, we'll get the case prepped and ready to put all this gear in it. Be back in a minute. Okay, so we're back now and we're uh, starting to prep the case, ready for the motherboard and all the other components to go in. Uh, I thought I'd do first is try and do a little bit of cable management. So I've routed the front panel IO. Now in order to do that, I had to install the front two fans, which if I remove this front magnetic panel, you may be able to just pick up those fans inside there. That's uh, two Asia Horse fans. There's four of those in total, two on the front for intake and two on the top for exhaust. Obviously heat is a, uh, a rising thing. So uh, convection hopefully will help out here and you've got cool air coming in, direct path cooling all the components and then going up and rising out of the top of the system. Heat rises, so makes sense to me. Um, yeah, so Two fans top, two fans bottom. I've put the two in the front. Now, unfortunately, this case, I don't know whether it's a pre-production model or something. It, I bought it as a genuine retail article, so it shouldn't have been. Um, but I actually had to drill out the front using the uh, 
trusty drill, and I think it's about a four and a half mil drill bit. Um, didn't seem that the holes for the screws, the, the regular case pan, uh, regular case fan screws wouldn't fit through the holes that were pre-drilled, and it looked like there was an additional circle around the hole, as if it hadn't been drilled for the second time. So I've had to do eight holes on the front, eight holes on the top, and obviously give the case a bit of a vacuum after to get rid of any uh, metal debris. But anyway, so we've done that, put the two fans in, and I've cable managed from the front IO panel here, and taking it through in between the two fans, which I'm not sure if I'll be able to give you a good shot of actually. So yeah, on the other camera. So from the IO panel here, the cables are running straight through and then through behind the panel. And they are then routed through the back. So we've got our main IO bunch here and I've got the, the front two case fans and there's actually, I've used a, uh, fan splitter as well so I can run two fans off of one output so I've got two outputs on here for chassis fans I'm using four fans so I've had to use two splitters so one splitter on each group so the splitters in there ready to connect to the motherboard um, I've got my IO ready and I'm just putting the last few screws in the uh, top mounted fan so let's continue on with that which is not going to be the easiest of things to do on camera, but I will give it a go. I've used these uh, Asia Horse fans before in a previous uh, Cooler Master build I did actually with the, the Cooler Master uh, Masterbox Lite 5, which uh, was a really, really nice looking case, but unfortunately the, uh, the airflow was absolutely awful on it, so it, uh, it had to go back. If you want to watch the video on it, uh, you can see it up here. It also seems that where the uh, the holes are for the fans to be mounted, they're, they've not been chamfered or counter sunk or anything like that. So the screws are sitting slightly proud of the surface. I don't know whether that's going to interfere with the, uh, the magnetic filter or not. No doubt we'll see in, uh, in due course. Never mind. Anyway, so that's the fans on. Get a nice shot of that there. So you can see one fan there, one fan there, and they are going to be, like I said before, red LEDs. So hopefully they're going to look nice. And apart from looking nice, hopefully they're going to provide some uh, some good cooling, and these filters will provide some good filtration. Okay, so that is the the fans done. Let's get rid of some of these screws. So the fans are done. Most of the IOs have uh, been routed and is out of the way. So the next thing to do is to uh, install the motherboard standoffs. So what we'll do is if we lie this case down on its side. Actually saying that, we don't really need that many standoffs because I think there's a few of them already been installed. So because it's a micro ATX build, we've got one there, one there, one there, one there. So we need one, two, yeah, just need another two standoffs, so that's pretty straightforward. So into our bag of screws, uh, one standoff, two standoffs. Actually, while I'm doing this, let's see what thread the standoffs are, because that's always a pain when you try and thread these things up. Right, so they're the coarse thread, not the fine thread. So actually, I just noticed uh, Keymaster have, in, have included a, uh, a little wrench. So you can put that on your screwdriver and use that then for the mounting pillars. So, pretty cool. But we don't need one because we've got our trusty Draper. If you don't know who Draper is, it's a UK make brand. They've been around for years. One, almost two. I often wonder if people like Linus and Bitwit go through this kind of thing, where everything they touch goes wrong. Probably does, but they edit it out, like I probably will. So you won't know what I'm talking about. 
Right, uh, so actually you might as well put the IO shield in. So IO shield, just to uh, tidy up the back plate. Obviously, keyboard and mouse are the holes at the top. So be careful with these because they tend to have sharp edges. But it just clicks into place. Yes, something went right first time. Awesome. Okay, so what next? Let's do the power supply. So power supply is held on with uh, four of the coarse type screws. And again, you can use either a screwdriver, crosshair screwdriver, or you could use um, some kind of socket wrench if you wanted to. But most people tend to use a screwdriver. Now with this, uh, this case, there is a filter all the way through the bottom and there is actually a rubber spacing grommet. So you can actually mount the fan whichever way you want. You can mount it fan up or fan down. For this particular instance, because it's a be quiet, um, I'm gonna mount it face down. So take off your mounting bracket and line it up with the four, hole, four screws, four holes on the back. It's not the easiest things to show you. See if we can get one of the screws in. This would be a lot easier with a modular power supply because obviously you wouldn't have all the wires getting in the way. But for this particular system build and the budget, uh, a modular power supply was pretty much out of the question. Okay, so that's the bracket attached to the power supply. So the power supply now can be put back in. So if we go around now, we should be able to put the screws back in. So give all the screws one last little turn, just to make sure they're in secure. Secure, as you see in the West Country. Okay, so there's our power supply installed. Pretty neat. So we can start uh, cable managing that in a bit. In fact, actually, we will start that now. So the main CPU power, we can take that one out straight away. As with the, actually both the SATAs, because both, uh, both SATA devices are probably gonna end up being rooted towards the outside of the chassis with the hard disk drive on the back side and the SSD mounted on either the top or bottom mounts. So we don't need the actual power cables on the inside. And we can also try and keep the build nice and clean. So eight pin power for the um, motherboard, that can go through the top as well. And that'll come back in with our CPU power. Just there, if you can see it, just come through that hole. So that's good. So the only one we've got really inside the case is gonna be the uh, GPU power, which is gonna end up around here somewhere. So uh, we should be able to tidy that pretty easily. So I'll leave that there for now. So next thing to do is to install the motherboard. You can just about see there, there is the uh, good old speaker, which I had to plug in to see what the BIOS was doing. Won't be needing that again. Fingers crossed. So actually I might try and see if I can get the uh, eight pin connector for the CPU on whilst it's here. It's gonna be a lot easier. Okay, so next is to put the course thread screws into the motherboard. So there's six of these we need. And they line up with the existing pillars that we installed earlier on. Well, two of them we installed. Some of them are already installed for us. Oh crap, that's in the wrong place. Okay, so schoolboy error, one of the pillars was in the wrong place. I presumed it was in the right place because it was installed from the manufacturer, but it wasn't. That's a very naughty thing you've done there, Cooler Master. I think it was then. So we've moved the pillar and back to putting our screws in. So again, like I said, coarse thread screws, six of them to go in. And that's just to hold the motherboard in securely. 
Now, I used to remember years and years ago, I'm not sure whether they still do it in some cases, cases, um, you used to get fibre washers to uh, insulate or isolate the board, whichever case may be. We don't seem to get them anymore. Okay, so that is the last screw. So that's the motherboard in, so what could we do now? Probably best to start connecting up all the things like the I.O. and the electrical components. So I'll go ahead and do that and then we'll be back and put the graphics card in. Okay, so we're back and I've done some cable management and plugged in all the uh, power supply cables as you can see from that angle. So um, what can I comment on? Well, I would say first of all, it's been a bit of a pain to work with, if I'm honest. Um, it would have been far easier with a modular power supply, I think, and possibly something without braided cables. I think the braiding and the fact that they were captive cables made it harder to route. Um, the motherboard being quite narrow as well has left it, so there's quite a gap between some of the openings for the cable management and the actual board. If I swing that around a little bit further. You can see what I mean. So the cables have had to come from this hole here and gone all the way across. Whereas if the holes were nearer to the board, but then that's hardly the case manufacturer's fault. Just one of those things in hindsight, um, looking at the chassis and looking at the width of the motherboard, it might have been better to have a slightly wider board to uh, sort of bridge that gap. But other than that, not too bad at all. Um, the other thing I would notice is the uh, HD audio cable was quite long but unfortunately due to where ASRock have put the HD audio cable I've not bothered connecting that. Um, I'm going to be using HDMI audio via the graphics card anyway so not a major deal and I don't really want to be plugging in um, headsets and what have you into the side panel in case they get broken off. This is probably going to end up living its life uh, beside a TV or something as a media center and a light gaming machine so that isn't going to be a problem. Um, Another thing I'm, I would say, again, not really a fault of the case, more of a, a fault with the board, is the uh, USB 3 header. Because the USB 3 cables tend to be quite, um, quite chunky, quite fixed, and not a lot of bend to them, it's had to go in and then sort of bend back on itself, which is, is functional, it works, but if the motherboard manufacturer had put the uh, USB 3 connector facing outward rather than, sorry, backward rather than outward, it would have been a lot neater finish. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's not the end of the world. The other thing I noticed, the rubber grommets for mounting the SSDs. Now, I'm a little bit unsure about why they've chosen to do that. The only thing in the case really that doesn't vibrate is the SSD, because there's no moving parts. But yet it's one of the few things which actually has rubber grommets. That would have been more sensible to use those in conjunction with the hard drive mount on the rear. So if I just actually spin it around, I'll show you how the hard drive is mounted. So a hard drive is mounted on the back here. There's a thumb screw and the plate. There's four screws which hold it on, but it would have been made more sense to put uh, rubber mountings on there to stop some of the vibration, but they haven't done that. Again, cable management at the back here at the moment, not at its best currently. Um, I'm going to live with it for a while and see how things go. I may choose to rewire it at a later date, but as far as I can tell at the moment, it's functional, or at least it will be when I get the graphics card in. So, um, see, so going back to the grommets, that's where the grommets are for mounting the SSDs. It actually makes the SSD a lot harder to mount than what it would be if there was some kind of bracket there. But again, it's quite a cheapish case, so you can't have it all. But all in all, it's not been a bad case to work with. It's been a little bit sort of um, perplexing at times trying to work out where to route the cables but when you get a new case or a new chassis there's always those kind of things that you're like oh how do I do this or what's the best way of doing this and time will tell but I think this is going to be a relatively popular case with system builders and modders for that matter but anyway let's get this graphics card in and get this thing fired up so we can uh, get windows installed and start playing games now the first thing we have to do is actually remove some of these uh, these rear blankings. They're the factory ones, which are kind of welded in, so they're gonna have to be bent out, which I'm not a fan of. It would have been much nicer to have the kind of removable slots in there, but uh, it is what it is, as I keep on saying. So I have to bend these out. Now, there is a kind of knack to doing this. 
they just wiggle it and generally they snap off pretty easily. Just being careful of the motherboard. I suppose really I should have done this before I installed the board just to uh, prevent any possible damage, but hindsight is a wonderful thing, which today would have been a great thing. So that's the, uh, the slots out. And let's put the graphics card in. It seems a terrible shame to put a second hand part or a used part inside of a new machine, but so yeah, as graphics card prices what they are at the moment, putting a new one in is just crazy. Oh, that's the graphics card locked in position. Let's put some screws in so it doesn't fall out. And so this is quite a uh, quite a longish card, the MSI GTX 770, uh, but it still fits in there, and there's plenty of room. You've probably got another three or four inches of room in there, so you could get quite a big card in there. And actually, depth-wise, width-wise, and depth-wise, there is quite a lot of space. So I was hoping that was where the uh, PCI Express cables were going to end up being roughly. So that's where it's out quite well. never going to go in first time, was it? <laughs> Not the way today's been. There's the reassuring click. So I'm going to have to try and work out a way of uh, cable managing that out of the way. But that may be something for another day. So let's get the side panel on, get some power to this, get it fired up and uh, see if it actually works. See you in a minute. Okay, so we've got the graphics card in and everything's hooked up and ready to go. So the last thing to do is to turn it on and see if it actually works and see what it looks like. So let's give it a go. Now the hard drive that's in there did have an old Windows installation, so whether or not it's gonna work, I really don't know, but we'll see. I don't know I got how I don't know how far I got with the installation, so it might be alright. Case looks really nice, and uh, I don't know if you can pick up the LEDs on the camera there. Can on the other camera. Let's uh, take that off so you can just see what I like. So that's what it's like without the filters. In fact, some people might choose actually to run it without the filters on. It's quite an unusual look. I haven't set up the fan profiles yet, so at the moment they're uh, running quite fast. But that's a good thing, it's keeping it all nice and cool, unlike the uh, the light box, Cooler Master, Master Box Light 5. I know I keep on going on about it, but I was really disappointed by that case. Let's put the filters back on. So there we have it, a, um, well, what was going to be a bargain basement budget gaming PC is now turning into something a little bit different, but still the overall result should be uh, should be pretty good. So in there we've got the, just to recap, Ryzen 3 2200G. Uh, we're not using the APU or the GPU side of it, so we're using a MSI GTX 770. There is a Kingston 120 gig SSD. In the back there is a two terabyte uh, Seagate hard disk drive. We've got the Be Quiet BN240 400 watt power supply from the System Builder 8 series. We've got the ASRock AB350M, and of course the Cooler Master Q300L. So, all in all, I'm quite impressed with it. I think it looks pretty nice, and uh, I'm going to turn the lights out now so you can see what it looks like with all the lights out. In case I forget to mention it, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews now, too. This has been the uh, almost bargain basement budget PC build and we'll see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching and thanks for sticking through to the very end of this video. See you soon.